Welcome to the World War I History Podcast, produced by the MacArthur Memorial. We invite you to follow us on Twitter at MacArthur1880 or find the General Douglas MacArthur Memorial on Facebook. This podcast was sponsored by the Ernst and Gertrude Tico Charitable Foundation. Prior to World War I, most people regarded the National Guard as the militia, not as a valuable part of the nation's strategic reserve. The 1916 National Defense Act, a piece of legislation that a young officer named Douglas MacArthur helped the U.S. Army lobby for, would lay the groundwork for National Guard units to be activated into federal service. In 1917, as the United States prepared to fight in Europe, National Guard units across the country were activated into federal service. Maine's 103rd Infantry Regiment was one of these units, and it would see service in France as part of the 26th Division. Known as the Yankee Division, the 26th would see considerable combat in France during the war. To discuss the experience of the 103rd Infantry Regiment during the war, we are joined by Captain Jonathan Bratton, Command Historian of the Maine Army National Guard, an author of To the Last Man, a National Guard Regiment in the Great War. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Well, we're very happy to have you today. So tell us about the history of the 103rd Infantry Regiment leading up to World War II. Sure. Yeah. The, the history of the, of the unit is, um, well, it's tied up really with the history of the state of Maine being a, a National Guard unit. So prior to the prior to the entrance of the U.S. into World War One, National Guard units were not they did not have federal designations yet. So uh, they would not take on the moniker of the 103rd Infantry uh, until the, the late summer of, of 1917. And so at this point, they exist as the second infantry regiment of the Maine National Guard, commonly known as the second Maine. Um, and like a lot of uh, National Guard units. They had a, a, a very long history going all the way back to the Civil War of the, the, the same regiment of that of that same name, the 2nd Maine Infantry that marched off from the state in 1861 um, and might be uh, known to many listeners as, uh, as showing up in the movie Gettysburg as the guys who don't really want to fight because they signed up for they thought they were signing up for two years uh, and instead they were signing up for three years. You know, one of those one of those great problems of paperwork that dominates armies throughout war. And and so through sort of a happy accident there with the those banners from the second Maine joining up with the uh, rather famous twentieth Maine uh, with Joshua Chamberlain uh, they end up fighting on, on Little Round Top and then and then through um, through their third their third term uh, and so with that the second Maine of 1916, 1917 time frame carried on a lot of that proud legacy of the Civil War. It, it really had that, uh, that strong community connection that could really typifies National Guard units to this day. So a lot of, a lot of heritage and a lot of those, uh, uh, a, a lot of the, um, the, the really deep ties into the community uh, and its leaders. And so we, we tend to see, we'll see a lot of those, those community leaders further on through World War I. We mentioned the National Defense Act earlier, and this places the National Guard under the War Department. How does this new relationship between the National Guard and the military work? Yeah, that's a fun question because everybody loves military policy, right? Like that's all all listeners of podcasts, like they they tune in because they're like, oh yeah, I can't wait to hear about the 1903 Militia Act and the 1916 National Defense Act. So to me, it's really cool because there's always been this huge tension in American military history between state troops and federal troops. Um, and we see this uh, in every single war. Uh, states very jealous of their militia leaving the state lines or or, or, na- or national boundaries. Um, and so to get around that, the federal government comes up with what are called the United States Volunteers. Uh, U.S. Volunteers are used heavily uh, in the Civil War, almost almost entirely with, with some small increase to their regular service, and then used again for the Spanish-American War in 1898. One of the great things that the War of 1898 proves is that the Army is, for lack of a better term, on a very amateur status. Um, it's amateur in logistics, it's amateur in training, it's amateur in standardization, absolutely everything. It's completely unprepared to take on any type of 
of global warfare or any type of conventional warfare, as we might call it today. Um, the army is really on this, this tipping edge of going from a constabulary force um, that was on the frontier and then the Philippines and the wars of expansion to really becoming a, a global world power. And so you've got you've got some parallels of of uh, of of what this army in transformation, this army in flux. And, and what happens is uh, in 1903, under the reforms of Secretary of War Elihu Root, the National Guard is brought in to the uh, to be a component of the uh, of the the regular or of the army, um, and the 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 militia becomes the the National Guard. And then 1916 National Defense Act gives that bill teeth, essentially, by bringing in the most important piece, which is money, <laughs> um, money and standardization. And so from now, from this point on, all National Guard units will have to be under the same regulations as regular Army units. They must, off, officers must pass the same exams uh, as, as regular Army officers. So, you know, absolutely tightening down on, on regulations and um, and also the army now authorizes states to to have units. Like I always used to say, prior to 19, 1916, if a state wanted to have a battalion of like winged hussars from Poland, you know, they could make one of those things up. They, they could just be like, hey, we've this is what we're going to have. And if we've got the money for it, we're going to do it. Now, uh, the War Department is going to say, hey, Maine, you are authorized this many infantry regiments. Uh, you know, Ohio, you're authorized this many units. Um, and then it, it also, um, so, so now the National Guard is brought into the whole military establishment. And it's, a, it's not a stretch to say that it's a significant time of growing pains. Um, the regular army has to figure out how they feel about the militia being part of this service. And the militia, the National Guard has to figure out how they feel about being sort of tied down almost as it were with a lot of these regulations, but it also comes with money. It means that now National Guard units are, are paid for, for drill weekends and annual training. Prior to that, it was just, you just got paid for annual training and uh, units drilled uh, on the goodwill system of, of uh, enthusiasm and patriotism and, and whoever would show up. So going into 1916, 1917, there's a huge question of, is this going to work? I might need to clarify this just for me. So as early as 1903, there's already that relationship between these state units and the military. Right. But 1916 National Defense Act is what really formalizes that relationship and adds that influx of cash to really kind of help in terms of logistics and training and so that they're actually ready to be something the military can use. Yes, precisely. And okay. it's really, and part of it is is due to, in 1903, the political impetus just isn't there yet. States have too much power and they're not willing to give up a lot of that authority. Secretary of War Root is attempting all these different reforms across the entire army and uh, <laughs> to a lot of opposition from the regulars and the and the National Guard and uh, and uh, but he he you know establishes a war college institutes this idea that we're going to have you know we need to start training for what we would call now large scale combat operations and so starts initial um, starts initiating maneuvers so there will be regional army maneuvers that will bring in regulars and National Guard together and it's fact it's in, in one of these early maneuvers that the second main will run into then second lieutenant George C Marshall um, as he oversees um, uh, watches them and you know is their evaluator for one of the maneuvers and it's it's funny you you begin to see these names popping up uh you know, second lieutenant Marshall second lieutenant Walter Kruger who's going to go on to command sixth army right. under MacArthur in the mm -hmm. Philipp in the Philippines who the the 103rd uh in World War II will fall under in the in the Southwest Pacific campaign you're just seeing these little these little um it's a small army even at that time uh of everybody running into each other and so yes it's the National Defense Act of 1916 that solidifies all of it um and, and it 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 is the it gives the authorization for forming the National Guard into the divisional system that will eventually um, come to play into the Army. Okay. So the first test of the National Defense Act, and correct me if I'm wrong, comes in the summer of 1916 when National Guard units are sent to the Mexican border. Are main units involved in this? Yes. Yeah. And, and, and you're absolutely right. 
it is it is a test some call it a dry run the the cynics call it a dry run they're saying you know you have the you have tension sparking because of the overflow of the mexican civil war um as some factions are trying to pull the u.s into involvement into the the conflict in mexico pershing assembles an expedition a punitive expedition and goes into mexico to calm the fears of many who live along the southwest border nearly the entirety of the National Guard is is activated. Over 100,000 troops from all across the nation are sent down um, and stationed along the Mexican border, patrolling along the Rio Grande and other areas. And the second main is called up in in June of, of 1916. And I always put it this way. It's like, this is the high point in these guys' lives. They think that this is, they don't know it's not war. It could be war, but bottom line, I mean, you're going from Maine to Laredo, Texas. I mean, you are, that is the, no, definitely not in Kansas anymore, not even in New England. So it's, it's a really this big adventure. Um, and what it, that experience does is, uh, is they, it, it gives the officers that practical experience of leading troops in some place that is, while not war, still very much an active operational environment. So they learn the the biggest things they learn are how to supply troops over long distances because these units are scattered all across the the second main is scattered all across the uh, the state of Texas from Brownsville up to the Rio Grande, Laredo, um, all over the place. And so officers have to figure out how do we supply these troops? How do we keep order trying to get you know, the sometimes unruly National Guardsmen to realize, hey, this is the way we do things in the Army. Um, and then operating alongside regulars and other other National Guard units from other states. Um, and so really, up, you know, when they come back in October of 1916 and are demobilized, the, for most of these guys, yeah, it was pretty boring, but that's they, they practically got to see Mexico. So this is the high point of their their lives. At this point, they're like, all right, well, I've done my, I've done my thing in the National Guard. What possibly can come next? <laughs> Right. So when the U.S. declares war in April 1917, what initially happens with the Maine National Guard? When are the units federalized and then how are they absorbed into the army? Yeah, this whole idea of how for the first time do we mobilize uh, a reserve component for a conflict that no one, even though you know it's been raging for a long time now, since August of 14, uh, all of a sudden we're in the war. Uh, despite Wilson, despite Wilson getting elected on, he kept us out of the war. All of a sudden they're in the war and there's a lot of uncertainty as to what role the army is going to take. Because right now the U.S. Navy is the premier power uh, for the United States military. Everyone initially thinks, well, it's going to be the Navy's fight. The U.S. cannot possibly mobilize quickly enough to, say, actually put troops in France within a year, enough troops to actually make a difference. And so the second Maine gets mobilized uh, the within the first week that the U.S. is at war, um, and they uh, the units report to their armories all across the state. And at first, they're sent off to do guard duty um, at places like railroad bridges between the United States and Canada, or uh, other key infrastructure points around the state. And I always like to point out, it seems very silly. Who on earth is going to, what German spies and saboteurs are going to flood into Maine? It, it's, it's doubtful, you know, how many German spies knew that Maine was a place. And yet in 1915, there's this crazy incident of a German spy coming down from, uh, from Canada um, and attempting to blow up the bridge, a bridge between the U.S. and Canada at the town of Vanceboro, which um, is a very, very small town. Um, it's a really bad place to be if you're a spy because everybody knows everybody in the town. And, you know, after the explosion, everyone's like, well, all right, who done it? Well, it's this guy because he's the, the one person that we don't know. And he readily admits to being a spy, very bad spy, very sp- bad saboteur. The bridge doesn't blow up fully. It's actually back in, in action the next day. But what does that do? It freaks out everybody in the Northeast. Uh, now everyone's like, you know, there's a sp- German spies everywhere. And I totally saw a U-boat and there was a Zeppelin over my house. And uh, there's there's an air of paranoia that goes out that is that continues through into 1917 all across the nation. These these worries of, of this, these secret German spies who have who have snuck into the country are now going to start uh, destroying all of our infrastructure. So 
not just the second main, but many national guard units around the state before they are federalized are put into this really boring guard duty uh, detail, but it doesn't last long. Um, after a very period, small, short period of training, the, the unit is assembled all together at the state capitol in Augusta, all, all 2000 individuals. Uh, they are mustered into federal service in August of 17. Um, and by September, they're in Massachusetts with uh, the 26th division that is now being formed. So the all of the National Guard of the of New England is formed into one single division, 28,000 men to be called the the 26th division. Um, and here the 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 weird mashup of units begins where uh, and it, you have to imagine it must have been rather difficult for for a lot of these longtime units like the the first New Hampshire who really they give up their colors and sort of their identity. Uh, as 1,500 of them are transferred into this new unit um, called the 103rd U.S. Infantry that's formed out of the, with the, the second main as its, as its uh, basis. But this is happening up all, all across the U.S. as all these old National Guard units going back, you know, sometimes hundreds of, of years, especially in Massachusetts, I mean, think back to 16, 1630s are sort of being mashed together into these new identities. Um, and so that's sort of the biggest gripe that everyone has is, well, I'm no longer in the 6th Massachusetts anymore, 9th Massachusetts or 2nd May, and now I'm in the 101st Infantry, 102nd, 103rd Infantry. And, and that's sort of how they are, are absorbed in their, their new army experience, all, all melded together into these fresh types of units and trying to figure out how do we get over our regimentalism and form some sort of a new identity, something that will bind the soldiers together. The 103rd arrives in France in October 1917. Can you tell us about their training in France and their first experience of combat? Yeah, uh, so the 26th Division is unique in that it is one of the first, it is the first so the first infantry division is the first to send troops to France and its infantry regiments are in France by the time the 26th division arrives. However, the 26th division is the first full U.S. division to arrive in France in the fall of 1917 due to its commander taking a very unorthodox approach to ports of embarkation. And by that, I mean, he connived to steal the transports for the 42nd division and get uh, the 26th there first. Um, as as the convoy, of the tw- as the 26th Division left Halifax, Nova Scotia, uh, they sent a, a wire to the War Department that was just like, "Yo, hey, 26th Division is on its way to France." And the War Department's like, "You can't, can't do that. It's like, that's not how this works. We're we're a professional army now." Uh, but the division commander, Major General Clarence Edwards, who was a, a West Pointer, a, a regular, he had missed out on combat in the the Spanish American War, and he did not want to miss out on anything here. So um, in doing so, um, he, he, uh, he, he manages to draw the wrath of General Pershing. Um, and they, they had been beefing uh, for a long time, like literally since the U.S. military, since West Point. Um, they've, they've sort of had a, a disagreeable relationship. So um, that's going to plague the division for the remainder of the war. But they get into France. And it's, it's really amazing reading these soldiers' letters because they're getting there before most of the U.S. troops. So nothing is set up. Like, there's no, there's no like, reception areas. There's no bases. It's literally, hey, you're going to march to this cantonment area that has no cantonment. You're going to set it up. We're going to be living in people's houses through the winter, which happens to be an incredibly cold winter. Um, oh, and also we have to construct our own training area. Um, they don't have all their equipment. It sort of arrives in fits and starts. So it's really this... I mean, we talk about expeditionary all the time. I mean, this is expedition. That's like literally show up with your your basic stuff and then figure out how to train, equip, and man your division when you are almost within sound of the guns while you're in France. Uh, and the French army takes them in, adopts them. Uh, the French army does so much to help the, the these first units, the the, the 1st Division, 2nd Division, 42nd, and 26th Division are often called the Old Reliables because they're sort of the first four that are, that are in theater. And um, the French Army does the best they can to teach them about how to survive on the Western Front. What does it mean to survive for these guys who have been surviving? Um, and the great irony, and I don't know if it's an irony because it's really cruel, is that what they're teaching the American soldiers is how to survive in the trenches, whereas American doctrine at this time is open warfare, which is almost exactly the same thing that the French started the war with and which caused the ghastly ca- casualties at the, at the first battle of the Marne. And, you know, the French and the British have learned over three and a half, four years of 
horrific conflict and bloodletting, how not to do things. And here come the Americans fully equipped with this idea of, hey, here's how we Here's how we do things. But um, the 26th Division goes into their first front, a, a training front um, alongside the French. And it's really here that they they learn how to uh, they learn how to conduct themselves uh, in a in a defensive position. Really, it's a it's a so-called quiet front. And by quiet, I always laugh at like how World War One fronts are described as quiet. It's like, oh, we only received a couple hundred artillery shells today. And you're like, oh, is that all? <laughs> That's uh that's that's horrible. Um, and and so here they learn the basics, uh, you know, patrolling, uh, managing to how to how to basically run a trench line. So put up your obstacles, doing all your uh, your obstacle repairs, your trench repairs at night, laying low during the day, um, rotating troops in and out of the front line, uh, sending patrols and raids against the Germans. And then and it's here that they they that they incur some of their first casualties. And, uh, and it's very hard um, because, like I said, these are, are units that are deeply connected with their communities. And a lot of these individuals, these leaders and those, the soldiers, they've known each other their entire lives. So in many ways, the National Guard experience in World War I is very much like the experience of U.S. volunteer units in the Civil War, where a really just one badly timed shell or badly placed shell bad piece of luck can mean an entire town could lose three or four young men in just in a day. Um, and that's, it's very hard to, to, to think about that today. Um, and, and this is sort of their, their first experiences of combat um, is, is alongside the French uh, in this area called the Chemin de Dame, this long massive ridge line, just really to toughen them up. Um, it's a, it's a so-called training front. Uh, the 26th is one of the few American divisions to actually get its, its allotment of, of, of training with allied partners that most units coming into theater aren't going to get simply because the Germans, um, you know, refuse to abide by American training timetables and accelerate the war just a little bit. Very true. So I think you've already touched on this a little bit, but how would you describe the 103rd's relationship with the French army and with French civilians? Yeah, I, that was one of the most fascinating things to discover when writing uh, this was, especially from the officers and men alike, from the enlisted men, they just write, you know, we really admired the French soldiers. They were teaching us how to survive and we listened to them as much as possible. And they really respected how much experience that the French had. They recognized, you know, we have this post post-World War II tendency to really minimize the, the French military. And, you know, teaching at West Point right now, I, I remind cadets all the time, you know, from from basically like 1066 to, uh, to 19, 1940, the great land power of Europe is the French army. And the there's there's one moment where uh, there, the, the later on in the summer campaigns, uh, one of the diarists writes a he, he writes about watching a French unit attack. And he says, here possibly are some of the, the greatest soldiers on the face of the earth, like watching them and to go into battle was was that every that everyone got out of the trenches to watch because it was so amazing to them. They were just so they were just so enthralled with um, with watching the French go into combat. And then with the with the, between the officers, there's a, this great relationship with um, uh, the officers spending time with each other, messing together. Um, the French introducing them to to red wine, um, which of course is very exciting for everyone. But there's also this great camaraderie that develops. And when the 26th Division moves out from under French command, uh, there's this beautiful letter that's written by the French 11th Corps commander, who basically calls the 26th Division the, you know, we are, we are the, you are the godson or of, of the, we are, we are your godfathers. Um, we are so proud of you. Um, and we look forward to seeing what you, what you do in the rest of the war. And then what's very interesting is that anytime and this goes not just for the 26th, but for many of the other AEF divisions. General headquarters under Pershing was incredibly critical of everybody who wasn't the first division, <laughs> really. I mean, uh, you know, MacArthur's 42nd comes in for its, for its share of criticisms. Um, and, uh, you know, anyone who's not the first division really gets criticized a lot by Pershing. The French are just so overjoyed to have the Americans there. And they are, they admit, they say the Americans are impetuous and they need to like figure out how not to run into machine guns because that's bad news. Um, but they are just so grateful that they're all there. So there's this wonderful feeling between French and American soldiers. There's moments where uh, there's this moment where uh, a French unit on the Chemin de Dame got gassed. 
and in, in the one, they didn't have enough uh, troops to evacuate a lot of the soldiers who had been gassed. Uh, one of the companies in the 103rd had just come off duty, um, and the men were actually bedding down to to get some rest. And they asked for uh, the first sergeant asked for volunteers. And every the whole company volunteered to go help out uh, the French on their on their flank. Um, and, then, and then with civilians as well, um, in this little town that they're billeted in, Lifo Le Grand, there's this great relationship that develops between the soldiers and the civilians because it's mainly children and and the the elderly and and then spouses and widows um, because all the men are off at war. And so these young men from New England, they pitch in to help out with the, the farm work. Um, they, uh, the, the regimental band is a hit uh, in the town as uh, uh, this one great moment they describe that the band starts playing and just like everybody just starts dancing from the, from the grandparents to the children. Um, this, and uh, an officer who comes through Le Fol Le Grand later in the war writes to one of his friends who's in one of the third, basically being like, what did you do here? They haven't stopped talking about you. Anything we do isn't good enough. They just love you. Um, and in fact, after the war, uh, the mayor will, will continue correspondence with leaders in the 103rd in Maine, just saying, hey, you know, happy Memorial Day, things like that. We're thinking of you. And it's these relationships that transcend the, the war. And it's kind of beautiful to see the, the friendships that, that spring up between the French and Americans. The 26th seems like one of those divisions that just gets picked for everything. They face elite German troops. They pioneer new tactics. They're at Chateau Thierry. They're at Belleau Wood, San Miel, the Meuse Argonne, et cetera. So members of the 26th see a lot of combat. Can you give us an overview of all of this combat service? Yeah, yeah, they do. They are everywhere. Like I said, they uh, they do. They're they're as part of the group of the old reliables. They're they're some of the first ones there, and they get leaned on a lot. Um, so yes, they uh, they replaced the first uh, they replaced the first division uh, for the first division to go off and and make its uh, its fight at Cantigny, which is often hailed as America's first offensive battle in World War One. Um, and they're holding this sector that's in the Saint Miel salient, where Germans basically decide, hey, we're going to hit these guys with with everything that we you know with, with some of our best troops, the the storm storm troops. Um, and every regiment gets hit. It's only the 103rd inside the 26th Division that doesn't lose any, any prisoners in this fighting. Uh, much of that is due to just the simple heroics of a lot of uh, small units and some, some individuals. So one of the really amazing stories in the 103rd is this group of nine young men, men from the Passamaquoddy Nation in Maine. It's one of, the, one of the Native American nations in Maine. Now, remember, these they don't they're not citizens. Um, they don't have the right to vote. Uh, they have nothing vested in this conflict. Um, and it's at the fighting uh, on June 16th at the town of Zivray, which is just this tiny little town, middle of nowhere, France, that sees this incredibly savage combat. Three columns of German assault troops decide to, to rage Zivray to seize prisoners from the 103rd on the early morning of, of June 16th. And two of these young Passamaquoddy men are, are holding a forward position. Um, they're ordered to evacuate. The, uh, once the German bombardment begins, they refuse to evacuate. Uh, one is wounded. But when the German columns come to hit the 103rd, the, the main, the center column hits just these two young men who have refused to evacuate and they have an automatic rifle set up in the town. Um, one of those men is, is killed, the other is wounded, um, but in doing so, they halt and break up the entire sequence of the German attack, um, just as this one little action. And unfortunately, it's one of the great examples of the issues facing um, the AEF uh, when it comes to race, uh, you know, so AF comes, managed to make great strides in embracing immigrants and it's immigrant, um, it's immigrant centric um, or, or, or wel very welcoming to immigrants and, and embracing that aspect. Um, not so with race. Um, and so Native Americans and definitely African Americans feel this. And so what should have probably been a distinguished service cross for a medal of honor for these young men boils down to a uh, award from the French, actually, for a uh, Croix de Guerre. Uh, for valor, but um, this is the really the the unit's first fight, and they do incredibly well. Um, the German after action report states simply: we have, you know, we have we have 
we are underestimating our enemy. The the Americans are fighting. They're they are watching our tactics and they're doing what we do. And there's a sort of a note of alarm in this after action report of what have we gotten into? These guys are learning way faster than we thought. And that's what it's one of the things that the 26th Division does. It learns very quickly. So when they relieve the Marines at Bella Wood in July of 1918. They off. They make a lot of the same mistakes as the Marines did in their first attack, and, and the Second Division did um, of going straight into machine guns. Um, but in doing so, they learn with the the price of casualties. There's this. Uh, it, it is it is a sort of horrendous bloodletting at the Second Battle of the Marne, uh, where the 103rd is is picked to 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 be this sort of uh, keystone. Well, and if I say Keystone, then everyone in Pennsylvania is going to get get upset that I did not talk about the 28th Division because that's, you know, all the regionalisms. But um, they're really picked uh, as this key unit to to break a German position. In doing so, um, we see almost the complete decimation of this one squad um, called the Skowhegan High School Squad. It's eight young men from Skowhegan, which is a small mill town in Maine, who join up all at the same time, literally when they graduate high school. Um, their graduation photo is them all in their olive drab uniforms. And in just one day, on the, the first day of the Second Battle of the Marne, you have over half of them killed and wounded um, just to, to seize this one this one position that actually has to be given up in, in fierce fighting. And, and so it's very devastating uh, to really this the, these guys who have been with the unit for so long, um, and it's at the the Second Battle of the Marne, Chateau Thierry, however you want to call it, that uh, the the unit begins to lose of a, a lot of its National Guard identity uh, because so many, just so many men are killed or wounded. On July twentieth, uh, the one hundred third is given the the mission of literally breaking the center of the of the German line on which hinges to the advance of two French armies. Um, and so one battalion goes into the attack with about 1,200 men, and they come out at the end of the day with 200 left in the line. And uh, it is from that the, the battalion commander sends back uh, a message to the regimental commander saying, we have, we have, uh, we have taken and held Hill 190, um, have less than 200 men left in the line, but if necessary, we'll hold to the last man. Um, and so that's where the the title of the book comes from. That's also where the uh, after the war, that's going to be the regimental motto. And is cu- currently our um, the, the regiment exists today is the 133rd Engineer Battalion, which is my unit. And that continues to be our our battalion motto um, from from their fighting at the uh, at the Second Battle of the Marne. They get like their their one rest and they get three weeks off uh, from from the war to take on a bunch of replacements. And then it's back in for the, the great offensive at, um, at Saint Miel. Uh, the designed really by principally by George Marshall, um, his ability to figure out how to get so much stuff and people places is really incredible. It just boggles my mind. And, uh, and of course the we'll wall see, we'll see a lot of people at the Sam Miel offensive, such as, um, Douglas MacArthur, George Patton, lots of individuals who will show up again in, uh, in world war II. And be- based off of the lessons learned for the second battle of the Marne, Again, I talk about the AEF as a learning institution. They take far fewer casualties uh, and, in fact, break through successive German positions, highly successful campaign. <clears throat> but it is still a lot of combat. Uh, you know, it's uh, all the way through the end of the war. They are holding frontline positions. And in doing so, that that incurs casualties just from trench raids and uh, and German shelling. And then as we near the end of the war, um, you know, a pandemic hits because why not? Um, just the, the 1918 influenza begins to take its toll, uh, as well as, as other other diseases towards the end of the war. But they are sort of all over the place on the Western Front um, as, as one of these uh, divisions that gets called upon to, to do sort of everything. Where is the 103rd when the war ends? By the end of the war, um, they are... You know, go figure. Uh, just north of Verdun, uh, that that uh, critical critical city from uh, the two years prior, uh, where the French said they shall not pass, and it becomes this this piece of of the French national identity. So they're like just a few miles north, and in fact, they're occupying the ground that was held by the French during the German assaults of 1916, and so. You can imagine just sort of the the hellscape that this is uh, by 1918. I mean, it's just everything is just utterly destroyed and devastated. Unfortunately, the 103rd is in much the same 
the same state. They are suffering from not enough replacements, too many casualties, too many people pulled out of the division to go and form cadre for other units or, uh, or, or pulled out because they're wounded and, and sent home. Um, and so really, you've got sort of each battalion down to around 200 troops um, from what it should be of about 1,400. So pretty bad. Um, and they are they are on the front line and they are attacking all the way up until the, the very last moments of the war. Um, there's a lot of controversy uh, when Pershing gives the orders for at the end of the war, every, you know, all American forces are going to be attacking up until 11 a.m., even though the armistice had been signed. Um, and so that's where they are when the war ends. And so because of this, because they're just exhausted, there's very little celebration. Um, most guys just completely collapse at 11 o'clock and they're either looking to sleep or find food, which are, I think is sort of indicative of, of most what most soldiers are usually looking for um, uh, at, any, at any war. And so that's where they are when the war ends, uh, just in that, in that shattered area of, uh, of Verdun. And I think that played a lot in the unit's morale um, with, with where they were. They're still taking devastating losses, um, even up to the very end, because they're attacking what, what the regimental commander is going to call a checkerboard of, of machine gun defenses, uh, just overlapping fields of fire, um, just utterly crazy. And they're still advancing through it, is, is the amazing thing. They're able to break through um, using essentially the German tactics against them, the infiltration tactics. So continue to learn to the very end, but it is very much a unit that is pretty played out by war's end. The division is absolutely so under strength by the end of the war that it's not selected for occupation duty. How many casualties, do you have a number on what the 26 suffered uh, its entire time in the war? And could you break out the 103rd and give us casualty numbers for them as well? Yeah, the overall uh, division statistics. So out of the four old reliables, it does have significantly fewer uh, than the first division, but it's around 15,000 for a division of 28,000, um, which is crazy. The, uh, the, you know, the first division is nearing 20,000 of, of 28,000. Um, they have so many replacements put through them. Uh, for the 103rd, they, their bloodletting was greatest at uh, at the Second Battle of the Marne, they took the most casualties out of any of the infantry regiments in the uh, in the 26th Division, and it is through the rest of the war they are are they are sort of uh, they're sort of trying to trying to recover from that. And so, for the 103rd, um, in the course of the war, they have uh, 371 men killed in action. Which, with another 21 dead from disease or accident, which I always find remarkable, since generally in war, you know, World War One is the first war where you actually have more people killed by the enemy than from disease, um, and even there is pretty close, just because of how many men die stateside from the Spanish influenza. One of the things we have to think about is just what a pandemic did to um, how, how to recruit for a war. So, for example, you know, even as the U.S. Army is screaming for tr more troops in the Meuse Argonne offensive, the largest and bloodiest battle of the, the, the war for the U.S. They cancel one of the draft registrations because, like, we can't, you know, in things that will sound familiar, we can't have too many people gathered together for that long. And I, I think it's fascinating to see what a pandemic does to uh, to a global war. Um, and then you have rough estimates of of just about two thousand. Who are who are wounded in action, um, and that doesn't even take into account the seventy likely seventy five to ninety percent uh, who are gassed um, or subjected to to poison gas. So out of the uh, I did the tallies on out of the two thousand men who who left Maine in the summer of of nineteen seventeen, half are killed, wounded, missing, or gassed, um, which are just sort of astronomical, especially for a conflict which is often just falls into the you know, the cracks of, oh, well, you know, that was a, we went to World War One we won that war. What does that do to, to families, to, to regional communities and, and, uh, and how we remember the war? Um, it really, it, it really just leaves some, some deep marks across the United States that I think we've never really come to terms with. What is the legacy of World War One in terms of the U.S. Army National Guard relationship? This is the first use of the National Guard as so-called the, the strategic reserve for the U.S. Army. In 1920, regular officer John McCauley Palmer will craft the, the National Army Act, 
And that is going to establish the, the three components of the army, uh, the regulars, the, the National Guard, and um, what, what is going to evolve into the Army Reserve. And so with that, there's this idea that when war comes, it's not, it, the National Guard is going with the rest of the army, and it's not going with it in a supporting role. It's not going in it, you know, it's not the regulars that are going, and then the National Guard's coming after. It's everyone's going all at once, which is exactly what happens in World War II. Uh, almost exactly the same thing, where you have guard and active units, um, guard and regular units arriving into the Pacific Theater and the European Theater sort of together. Um, the first the first tank battle in that the, uh, the army actually conducts in World War II is in the Philippines, and they're National Guard tanks against Japanese tanks. Doesn't really go well for, for us, but you know. The so so there's this I there's a establishment of we're all in this together. That said, the legacy, um, especially in terms of officers, is really really rocky. You have a lot of regular army officers um, serving in National Guard divisions, such as Douglas MacArthur, as for one. But you also have you have you continue to have a lot of people in the regular army sort of looking down. Um, on National Guard units, even though they've got their their peers serving as leaders of these units. And most of these peers love these troops. Um, there's General Edwards fell in love with the, the 26th Division. Uh, there were a whole bunch of West Pointers in the 26th, and they appreciated these soldiers for the ingenuity that they brought and the heart that they brought and the, this almost community feeling that these units had. But there's just this friction that develops um, between the guard and the regulars, which is going to continue through World War II, and in some, you know, in some ways, still continues today. There's jokes back and forth between you know all components as everyone just sort of just friendly jabs at each other. So that is an aspect of the legacy of World War One that we the U.S. Army still hasn't quite shaken, and the you know the relationship continues to change and evolve. Where even today, in a time of peace, you know, nominal peace, you still have guard units who are uh, forward deployed in Kuwait, Syria. Um, there were guard units, you know, helping to secure the Kabul International Airport during the evacuation last year. Um, you've got guard units in Kosovo, in um, all across Europe and the Atlantic Resolve. So there's a, a big question of, uh, so now, now it's no longer the Guard is the strategic reserve, but the Guard is the operational reserve for the Army. And that leaves a lot of questions, because what does it mean for a part-time force when they're taking on full-time requirements? And that's one of the big unanswered questions that's out there um, that really, I guess, time, is, time will tell uh, as we see how that affects the, the guard and the active component, how that affects our foreign policy, uh, you know, all the all the trickle down effects from from there. The evolving role of the guard is very, very interesting, I think. Any final thoughts? World War I deserves our attention a little bit more than than we give it. I, I, I kind of refer to it as, as a forgotten war. It, it goes on that list of <laughs> There's a whole litany of forgotten wars. You know, we referred to Afghanistan for a while as the forgotten war. Korean war is up there. World War I shapes not just the U.S. Army, but the nation in ways that, that we're still figuring out. Odds are, if you go into a town, you're going to find across the U.S., you'll, if you're on the East Coast, you're going to find a very prominent Civil War monument. Not so prominent a lot of times, but virtually everywhere are very hidden monuments to World War One. Whether it's a plaque in a school uh, to the first young man from the school who died in the war, whether it's a um, plaque in a church or the city hall or something like that, there's always there's they're there, they're everywhere. Um, they're just sort of hidden in plain sight. What the what World War One does to the army is it is. I guess the best way I could put it, you know, I put it to my students this way: you take a soldier from today. And you put them in a civil war unit and, you know, send them back in time to the civil war. They're going to go, I don't understand the tactics. I don't understand who's supposed to be where. I don't really understand the uniform. I don't know what's going on. You take a soldier from today and you put them in a, you send them back in time to 1918 into a, a World War I U.S. Army squad. They're going to understand pretty much everything. It's going to be a little different, but it's all looks very much the same. And it is the birth of the modern army. So everything of who we are in the army comes from this 
18 month period, right? Like it's a, it's just like really quick flash in the pan all comes from that time. And if we don't properly understand that, I don't think we properly understand our army today. We don't understand the decisions of leaders. We don't understand why does our army look the way it does? Well, it looks the way it does because that's how it was set up for World War One. Um, and we've just been sort of having variations off of that ever since. So I think it's it's really critical for us as a nation to understand that. And then at a personal level, you know, I, I did not intend to write this book. I didn't set out and be like, hey, uh, this is a really cool idea. I'm going to go write this book. No, it was, I just kept finding story after story after story after story of all these individuals from letters, diaries, journals, all these things they left behind, often, almost all of them un unpublished. And as they sort of accumulated, I just had this growing feeling, this weight of, I can't keep this to myself. These are their stories. These are stories of young Americans who went off on this great adventure, having no idea what was going to happen. And many of them didn't return. And those that did brought back a lot of burdens from, you know, health uh, effects to their health to what, just what does it mean when all your friends from high school are dead or wounded, um, which is. Yeah, you know, these these shocking uh, these shocking losses, and also even more, what did it mean to have that experience to go do that thing that Wilson says we're going to make the world safe for democracy? What does that what does that mean? And so you see so many of these veterans getting into a public sphere after the war to try to make a difference, to try to make a change to this world that they saw really at its worst. Um, and I think we owe that generation at least a duty to remember if not to, uh, you know, to try to learn more about them. Uh, it's just, a, it's a fascinating era. These were fascinating young men and, and women and, and their stories are, are timeless. And so it was a real pleasure to be able to tell them. Thank you so much for joining us. And we'll look forward to seeing what your next big topic of research is. <laughs> no pressure or anything. Thank you so much for having me. It was a, it was a real honor to be on. Thank you for listening. If you have questions, suggestions, or comments, we want to hear from you. You can find us on Twitter at MacArthur1880, on Facebook as the General Douglas MacArthur Memorial, or you can email MacArthurMemorial at Norfolk.gov.